All right, so we are going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to do a couple intro things with some announcements, and then we will actually get the webinar going. So we are talking today with Eric Vance uh, using team-based learning to teach data science article that was recently published in the Journal of Statistics and Data Science Education. Um, I'm Lee Johnson. If you haven't met me before, I'm at Capital University in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and so I'm sort of the host and moderator and can help facilitate questions and that sort of thing. Um, just the latest articles uh, in the journal. Um, there's some good ones and we've had several published within the last few weeks. So please check it out. Um, I know I'm particularly interested. There's a data set for a World Cup data set uh, that they used in three different types of classrooms, probability theory classroom, applied stats modeling classroom. Um, so that's one that I'm kind of interested in, but there's lots of great articles that I'm sure appeal to everyone or to different people. Um, our next month's webinar, uh, short time in between, so in about three weeks, uh, Adam Loy from Carleton College is gonna talk about visual inference in the classroom. Um, if you're here, you probably know how to sign up for webinars, but again, please sign up. Uh, it'll be February 15th at 4 p.m. And webinars are recorded with the slides. So when we are done with this webinar, there will be a recording. We will have the slides for you to uh, peruse at your own leisure. Um, coming up, if you haven't heard, ECOTS is in May, um, so save the date. There'll be pre-conference workshops May 19th through the 20th. Um, we are still accepting proposals, or CAUSE is still accepting proposals, but they are due January 30th, so please get on getting those in. Um, and the theme this year is preparing the modern student. Um, also, as people's semesters are getting going, uh, don't forget about the Undergraduate Statistics Project Competition. The deadline for entries is in June. Uh, there's more info here, uh, but there is a, a class project section now and a research project section. So just something to think about as you're getting your courses going uh, this semester. All right, and just a brief introduction to our uh, webinar presenter. Uh, Eric Vance is an associate professor of applied mathematics at um, University of Colorado Boulder. And he's also the director of the Laboratory for Interdisciplinary Statistical Analysis, LISA for short. And he is the global director of LISA, the LISA 2020 network, which comprises 35 statistics and data science collaboration laboratories in 10 developing countries. Um, he's a fellow of the American Statistical Association, and he is the winner of the 2020 ASA Jackie Dietz Award for the best paper in what was the Journal of Statistics Education, and it is now the Journal of Statistics and Data Science Education. So I am just very quickly going to stop sharing my screen, and Eric will go ahead and get started. Great. Thank you, Lee. Um, welcome to everybody. So I'm going to be talking about using team-based learning to teach data science, and I have a few slides. I'd like to have it uh, to be interactive. Um, so if you have questions, go ahead and ask them, uh, maybe put them in the chat or maybe just uh, unmute yourself and or raise your hand or I don't know if raising hand works because I can't see people, but um, maybe yeah, I think there's a Q and a thing I think you can raise your hand there's a couple of different. Ways oh, I see there's a Q and a and then there's the chat. Okay, so do whatever you do in zoom and uh, <laughs> we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out and then we also will have time at the end for for questions. So, okay, I'm going to share my screen and then I'm going to try to put it on the uh, um, view. Now, does everybody see my title slide? Okay, great. So, um, so I'll get into it and say that statisticians and data scientists need to know many things. So, you need, you know, our students need to know statistics and math and coding, programming, data acumen. Uh, in industry, you need to know um, database management, HPC. Uh, our staff, you know, our data scientists also need to be ethical data scientists. Um, and even being an effective data scientist, you need to have some domain expertise. Um, and then there's the whole thing about data acumen, right? I, I think of that as data intuition. And so there's a lot that a a practicing data scientist needs to know and therefore needs to learn. 
And um, it's hard really then to have somebody, this unicorn, who has all of that, you know, under one in one head. Um, so an alternative to trying to be a unicorn is to learn effective collaboration. So the idea is that if you have a really good understanding of statistics and math, and you're you know, a, a decent coder, and you have that data acumen and you act ethically, so maybe these like forced four Venn diagram circles, if you also learn effective collaboration skills, then you can collaborate with the domain expert, you can collaborate with the high performance computing person, you can collaborate with the marketing you know, executive who has that business acumen and collaborate with the data, database manager. In short, a, status, a data scientist you know, with, with good skills, good technical skills and the collaboration skills can then work with anybody and everybody and all sorts of different kinds of teams you know, and bring in people to cover for, for his or her weaknesses or um, be able to effectively collaborate, bringing in their own strengths to, the, to a team. So um, how do we teach collaboration in a statistics or data science curriculum? And so one answer is this number one, you can actually teach collaboration in, for example, a capstone course. And so I teach, uh, and, and what to teach, uh, we, Heather Smith and I have encapsulated our philosophy of teaching collaboration in the ASKER framework. So that's uh, five components. There's attitude, structure, content, communication, and relationship. And so uh, that's, uh, I teach it in a, in a capstone course, 15 weeks. Um, Heather and her colleagues you know, teach it in like a 10 week course. And, and so this is a great way to, to give explicit instruction and experience to our data science students in collaboration. And you can read about like the, the what, the asker frame um, in, uh, in this paper, bit.ly slash asker frame uh, in the Journal of Statistics Education. Okay, so the second thing then, how can we teach collaboration in data science cu curriculum is, well, it's, if, if we think it's important, and I do think it's really important for data scientists especially, we can teach it throughout the curriculum kind of by, uh, you know, for free by using team-based learning. And so um, I teach or have taught an intro to data science class for freshmen statistics and data science majors. So it's a, it requires calc, the prereq is calc one. We don't use any calculus, but, but there's that prereq. Um, and we go through 29 of the 30 chapters in Hadley Wickham's and, and Goleman's R for Data Science. And um, at the end of this course, you know, they've learned like lots of content about data science, but they also, because of the team-based learning structure of the course, they basically learn collaboration for free because by, by doing it every day in class and every week on weekly collaborative assignments. So team-based learning combines flipping the classroom with um, problem-based learning, more in, in small group learning. So it's more small group learning, not necessarily problem-based learning, but it flips the classroom and has a small group learning. And so there's a lot of collaboration that happens in class and out of class with uh, between the students. So um, I'm going to just give a couple results of the class and then talk about sort of what is team-based learning. So I had really five main categories of student learning outcomes. So I wanted my students to learn like work data science workflow using RStudio and and creating our markdown documents, um, using collaborating with each other with GitHub, et cetera. Uh, beginning our topics, maybe chapters one through 12 or one through 15 in the R for Data Science book. Advanced R topics, so chapters 16 to 30, minus one of those. Um, and then of course, I also wanted my students to learn statistical thinking 
so this was this is their first course in the major and so i wanted to get them thinking about well ultimately we, we went up to testing hypotheses via simulating via via permutation tests or, or randomization tests um, but then also like the statistical thinking types of activities of thinking about confounding variables and simpson's paradox etc and then the fifth of uh, these major uh, learning goals would be communication and collaboration. So I am a big proponent that if we you know, can teach our students the regular statistics and data science stuff, and then also teach them collaboration, they're gonna, have, they're gonna just be more successful in their future careers uh, with those collaboration skills. So whenever I teach a course, I always try to build in the communication and collaboration components uh, within within the within every course that I teach. So the way that um, so I, I taught this course three times um, from in 2018, 2019, and students learned the workflow. Well, they they said is you know pretty good between pretty good and very well. Um, the beginning topics, you know, so the deep liar stuff, the filter select and the GG plot. Um, also, you know, they, they learned it, they, they felt that they learned it pretty well. Um, the advanced topics, not so well, but not terribly. The statistical thinking topics, not so well, but also not, not so bad. And then definitely the communication and collaboration, those were some of the top, top rated um, skills that, that the students they rated themselves at the end of the at the end of the course like how well do you think you learned this topic you know five four three two one kind of thing um, okay I'm gonna pause just to check to see if there were any questions that came in uh, I do see a chat with a number yeah there were a couple of times I was waiting for a point to stop you one was how were the data collected for the five categories um, the other was how did you account for the errors in measurement um, and the previous question was referring to when you talked about um, extracting, needing to know information in all the different categories. Um, did you need to know it necessarily, or you need to be able to extract the information from your colleagues? Um, was sort of the context of that question. Right. So I think for collaboration, um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say extract. I mean that. That makes me think of mining and extractive economies and all that stuff, but rather collaborate, right? So if I'm working with an archaeologist and he's trying to, he's studying how ancient, you know, arrow points, um, how effective they are, and he has some like modern day experiments and wants to do, do all of this like linear regressions and and data analysis to understand the, you know things uh things about ancient arrowheads um i'm i'm collaborating with him to create shared understanding about the technologies that he's using about the the way that he collected the data and you know how the data were measured and sort of what the theories are so these theories of, of drag and f equals ma and stuff like that um, and so you know, he has the domain expertise in archaeology. I have the statistics and data science expertise. And so then, you know, we work together to figure out what the context is, what the necessary aspects are, you know, how statistics or data science can help. And then, you know, I, um, I go in and provide that statistics expertise, and then maybe I teach him how to do it as well. So, uh, I would say that a data scientist really needs to be able to collaborate with people, lots of different people who have lots of different information, and you know maybe be able to assimilate it all in in our own heads as data scientists, um, but and and then communicate it right. So anyway, I think I think there's definitely um, definitely a need for data scientists to collaborate, and then just for these data right here. Um, I think I did sort of mention I had maybe, I don't know, maybe like 30, 25 different to uh, specific topics that I combined into these five learning goals. So for example, workflow consisted of 
can I work with our studio? Can I make our markdown documents in you know, GitHub? How effectively do I use GitHub? So those three topics are like the workflow topic. And these are student self-reported data at the end of the semester. Um, for statistical thinking, you know, Simpson's paradox, confounding variables, difference between a, a designed um, experiment versus a, an observational study, um, as well as yeah, some of these simulating of p-values and all that stuff. So these were like maybe 25 or 30 different specific student learning outcomes that I then grouped into these five categories. Um, and then a question about how do you teach collaboration? Well, we haven't written the paper about teaching, but what to teach we have written. You teach them the attitude, and attitude can, can be learned. You teach them structure, you teach them content, communication, relationships. So these are five components uh, of a different paper. Um, so uh, sure, I'm going to go on now to talk about team-based learning. So in a nutshell, you create permanent teams of four to five students. These are balanced teams, meaning, well, uh, you can read the paper for more details about that, but these are permanent teams that the students are going to be working on, working with um, for the whole semester or the whole quarter or whatever. And I usually create teams in the second week, um, and that works well if the course is like a required course, and so there's not a lot of adding and dropping. I just recently taught a course that was a, it's more of a, uh, an intro to data science course for non-majors. And for that one, I'm actually going to have individual work for the first four weeks. And then starting week five, we're going to do the teamwork um, because there was like, there's so much adding and dropping that when you have permanent teams and you have like a team of five and then three of them drop, that like, that's terrible. So create permanent teams of four to five students at the appropriate time in, this, in, the, in your term. Um, the second major aspect of team-based learning is what they call the readiness assurance process. So the, the basic idea is that the professor only lectures on material that the students need help understanding. Uh, I mean, that the students yeah, can't, can't learn it on their own. And so for this readiness assurance process, for each module of the course, I actually made a seven module course for a 15 week semester. Um, usually, usually it's maybe four, or sorry, five or six modules, but each module, and I'll, I, have a, I have a diagram in the next slide, um, but each module starts off with this readiness assurance process. So there are readings that the students read and then they take an individual readiness assurance test, this IRAT, at the beginning of each module. Then they take the exact same test as, as a team. And then there is discussion, clarifying lecture. So that's, that is the time that I lecture on the topics that the students need, need my help understanding. Um, and so the idea is that they're learning a lot of content before coming to class. And then part three are these team application exercises where the remainder of the class periods for that module are students working together to do data science, to, um, to code, to come to a, to a specific conclusion, and then they share their conclusion with the class, and then there, there can be some uh, discussion between, between teams. Um, and then the fourth component is this peer evaluation and team maintenance, where the students actually give qualitative and quantitative feedback to their teammates. And I make this 20% of the student's final grade. And so the students are actually giving scores to their teammates. And that really helps with the uh, preventing the social loafing, right? So small group learning, collaborative learning, there can be drawbacks. And team-based learning uh, is structured to minimize a lot of those negative aspects of group learning. Um, so students, students don't, students do the readings because when they come in, then you know, then they they might fail the test, the individual test, and so they would 
you know, they, they want it, they're accountable to themselves to do the reading if they want a, a decent grade. And then if they um, can't contribute on the team test, like the teammates are gonna be like, come on, man, like read it. Like, we really want your opinion. You know, we want, we want your, your help with these, uh, you know, these assignments and all that stuff. So, you know, you need to read the, assign or read the assignment. And that's a lot more effective than me saying, hey, you really need to read the assignment. Um, it's the students, the peers saying, hey, you really need to read the assignment. And so they do, um, they read the readings. Um, and then this peer, anyway, the peer evaluation team maintenance is another part of that component where they are, uh, they, they get feedback from their peers, but they also are accountable to their peers. And so if they're loafing, then they get a low grade. It, conversely, a student who's doing like all of the work who might otherwise complain like that they're doing all of the teamwork, um, they get like a really high grade. So um, they, don't, they don't complain so much. And the work is more balanced because of all of this. Um, um, sorry, yeah. can I interrupt for just a sec? We did have a couple of questions come in the Q&A and you may have answered these a little bit. Um, John Gaberzak asked, if you wait a month to create the teams, are you fearful that students who performed well in the non-team environment will resent being forced to work into teams. He's kind of run into this a little bit. Um, and then we'll maybe start there and we'll go with the next one. So I haven't tried this wait a, wait a month yet, um, but I think it's gonna work better than, than it currently worked. So I taught you know two different courses. One was for statistics and data science majors. And the other one was for non-majors specifically it was teaching data science from a humanities point of view, um, from a humanities perspective and like integrating humanities and trying to doing that to try to teach data acumen better for, for everybody, you know, the people who are gonna be taking just one data science course, but also even my own majors. Um, it's still basically an experimental course. Um, and they didn't, they didn't, well, anyway, the teams weren't as highly as highly productive as the stat major teams, and so I'm I'm going to change it up. So, will the high performing students resent um, being like you know switching from individual to team? Possibly. On the other hand, the high performing students, are, you know, I think the way that I think doing that is going to make everybody up to speed, um, and so they're not going to have to do the lion's share of a team assignment, you know, at the end of the semester. So there'll be trade-offs and we can always manage expectations. Well, we can try to manage expectations. Um, so the second then, oh, Yeah, sorry. extroverts, introverts, no. But what we do is account for experience um, or some kind of, yeah, like, you know, did they take AP stats in high school or do they take programming or are they not a freshman? Like, so the number of courses that they've taken and the idea is to balance sort of the, the technical skills. Um, in terms of like extroverts, introverts or personality types, no, like in, the, in, in industry, they're gonna be working with all sorts of t people. And so they're gonna, learn to work with all sorts of people, whether they're an introvert or an extrovert, or they're collaborating with introverts, extroverts. Um, you know, we just teach them to collaborate with all sorts of people. Uh, and so for the peer evaluations, I actually do it three times, right? So basically five weeks, 10 weeks, and then final. And, you know, that first one is worth 3% three, 3 of the grade. The second one is worth like 7%. And then the third one is worth 10%. So total twenty percent total, but in a in a um, high more weighted towards the end of the semester. So they could get slammed in their first feedback, and then you know bring it up, and they're not going to get hurt in their grade by, by very much. They could, you know. But what you usually see is like a slacker at the beginning, is a slacker at the end, and again, there aren't a lot of slackers when you do it when you do it right and you have like really good team application exercises that make the team teams bond but if you do it poorly then you could get slackers um so just right. quick follow-up yeah. sorry just to get you um do you have an issue where students actually give their evaluations and give really high scores because they don't want to hurt their classmates grades have you run into that 
Um, no, because there, there are rules about it. So basically, if you're of a team of four, each person gets 30 points to give to their teammates. And the maximum is 15. And they can't give 10, 10, 10. So there has to be a range of two. So they could give 11, 10, 9, or they could give 15, 10, 5. And so they end up, um, you know, at the beginning, well, okay. So I've done this in many different classes. And um, I had in my capstone collaboration class, everything worked really, really well. And like the very, the variance in the, in these uh, peer evaluation scores was like really small. Like nobody got less than a nine, you know, or more than like an 11.5. Um, and yeah, so, uh, right. So there's, there are some rules about that. Um, so here, I wanted to show this, this uh, picture. Um, I hate cat me. I used it once a few years ago. I do not like it whatsoever. And so I have a colleague who is developing our, our tools. So we have like a TBL tools proto uh, R package. Um, and there is a lot of setup. Like there's, there's a lot of setup for that. But I want to talk about the rhythm of TB TBL. So you break your course into modules, and then you know each module follows the same pattern. There's the pre-module readings, and then the individual readiness assurance test, the team test, there's an appeals process, and then a clarifying lecture. And the idea be, and is that that's like one class period, so 50 minutes or 75 minutes. And by the end of that class period, you know, there are deficiencies in their readings or the are, are remedied so that they can you know, start doing team application exercises. And it actually doesn't always take 50 minutes. So maybe like, wow, it takes probably like 45 minutes. So you know, if you have a two day a week class versus a three day a week class, you have to adjust the readiness assurance process. And then the rest of the class periods are students working in teams on, on, um, on team applications. And these team applications have to be pretty well designed and that's hard to do. Um, and so that's why I actually really welcome this opportunity to give this talk because I'd like to, you know, to, to, have, to build up a community of team-based learning teachers of data science so that you know, I can develop three really good application exercises and share them with Matt, who has, you know, developed four more really good team application exercises, and we share them, you know, we share them, and so we don't have to all reinvent the wheel. Um, yeah, so the, the R package is uh, in development. Um, it, we need, to, we need to just get it to be the, like the official package. So there's a lot of stuff that I'm not willing to do on that. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna skip, I'm gonna skip even this. This is seven tips for overcoming barriers. So there are barriers and then there's ways to overcome them. I'm gonna skip it and then go to resources. So team-based learning is an actual thing, right? It's not, it's like capital team-based learning, capital TBL trademark. Um, because it's a very specific thing. If you do it half halfway, you're really liable to uh, to screw it up. Um, so teambasedlearning.org, lots of uh, lots of resources. You should definitely read my paper first. So this paper and you know using team based learning to teach data science. I kind of I'm trying to yeah read that paper. And if you're still interested, then uh, then go to teambasedlearning.org, etc. Um, for collaboration, there's this paper, and then of course R for Data Science um, link. Oh, and even more collaboration resources are on this other link. As as Lee said, that these uh, this these slides will be available um, to the community. Okay, so I'm going to stop my share, and then, well, I don't know if we have any more time, but. I'm, I'm well, we can do a few more minutes. Um, there were a few questions in the Q&A that I didn't quite get to. Um, there was a question about the IRAT and the TRAT. Are they part of the course evaluations? So IRAT and TRAT are tests that count for their grade. So they are assessments. 
Um, yeah. You know, and so kind of the idea is like, let's say you, let's say you're a student, you do the readings and you get, you know, you get eight out of 10 right on the individual test um, because you're not just born brilliant or something. Um, well, then in the team, like the ones that you missed, like somebody else in your team has gotten right, and then you kind of debate, and then you're like, oh, okay, oh, oh, that makes sense. So with the team discussion, you end up sort of mediating any misconceptions you have about the, about, about the work that you're, you're doing, about, about the concepts. Um, and it's, it's like, a, it's really effective and efficient way to remediate those. Anyway, the point is then the team test, they usually score a lot higher. Uh, and then, um, yeah, they're, they're definitely, those are part of the grade. And then I have like weekly data science projects that are part of the grade, as well as a, the peer evaluation. Um, one of the questions was how large are the classes and do all teams have the same team assignment? Same team assignment for all teams. Um, and that's, that's really important for doing for in class because then the teams can compare their own results. Like, you know, they're comparing apples to apples. Um, and so I teach about 50 students in uh, 55, 60, whatever, 55, between 50 and 60. Um, I started off, my first class was 17, which is really nice to be able to start it out. And then it grew to like 50. Um, that's one of the cool things about team-based learning is that it actually scales really well uh, because there's the small group, small class atmosphere where there's a lot of discussion within the team. And so if you have 60 students and 15 teams, there's like 15 people talking all at once, um, you know, in parallel. And so there's a lot of discussion that is, is uh, well, it's really, it, it gets that small class feel even, even in, if in a 200 person class, potentially. Um, you may have answered this already, but I'll ask it again. Do you give a grade for the application exercises? Uh, do teams submit their work when they do data science? Those are kind of connected. Um, how do you check their work? Do you walk around or is it? Yeah, so mostly, okay, so in a lot of, I don't have my props, um, sort of, you can do it. Um, so some of the team-based, sorry, some of the team application exercises, uh, they end up being like a multiple choice. And so then the teams will flash up their cards. So like, you know, I'll have like, um, you know, A, B, C, D, E cards, in different colors. And so, you know, we can say, okay, on the count of five, all the teams, you know, what's your answer to number one? And then you see like, you know, A's and C's. And so there's like, then there's discussion between, okay, why did you guys choose A? Why did you guys choose C? Um, each person on the team is, is responsible for justifying their team's answer. Um, and so sometimes, you know, so some this works really well when there's maybe gray areas in in a data analysis. So you know, um, and so that so maybe A is correct and also C is correct. And then why is it? Why is why did one team choose the other? I mean, choose one answer over the other. Uh, but then there's also possibilities of you know just just one correct answer, and then you get a C of A's, and that maybe that's if that's the right answer. And you're like, okay, good. We don't need to discuss that. Let's move on to the next one. Um, you know, but then if there's you know a few few teams that got the wrong answer, then we kind of figure out, okay, why was that? And then we and then we move on. Um, oh, and so, do I actually grade the team application exercise? I don't. So sometimes the answers are just like whatever their answers are, A, B, C, D, E. Sometimes it's a plot. So it's like you know make make your best plot, your team's best plot that shows such and such, whatever, the answers, answers this question. And then they post it on like, I forget even the thing that I do, but you know, they post it online and then, and then you can kind of do a simultaneous reveal. Um, still working out the kinks, you know, I, what is it? Jamboard, 
can work for that, stuff like that. So there, there can be actually an assignment that they have to submit. Um, but I don't, I don't, I don't have the patience for grading that. Um, but others, others might. I, uh, I don't like grading. So I basically it's like check. And if they didn't, and I don't even check because they all, they all do it. Because if they don't do it, then I get mad at them. Uh, there was a question I missed back a little bit. Um, are there any circumstances that you would, under any circumstances, you would reassign a team, or do you strictly adhere to permanent membership? Yeah, so I've never reassigned a team. I would maybe reassign a team if there's like something that's like even above my pay grade, like, you know, sexual harassment or something like that. That hasn't happened. You know, if there's a loafer, it's like, let's like, you know, work with that person, intervene early. Um, but no, because the idea is like, if you're on a team in industry, um, you're not going to, well, you, you might, but basically work with what you have. That's kind of the, the answer. And, and then you can help, you can help, uh, you know, intervene on, you know, if there's conflicts between people. One of the things about team-based learning is that these are, it's not self-selected teams. So there's not like a group of three students who are all friends and then the fourth, like, you know, interloper um, that they bully or something. It's sort of randomly done, and the professor has to create the teams, no self-selected teams. So that helps a lot with uh, the team dynamics is everybody's all sort of new. And then you and then if you have some team applications, exercises that build team cohesiveness, like that's fantastic because you can there can really be like an us versus them. It's like our team versus all those other teams or like that that makes them bond. And so there are strategies for that. Um, there was a couple of questions related to your clarifying lecture and just how you kind of figure out what needs to be in that. Um, yeah, so, um, so you're, you know, you're walking around while the students are discussing their team test or, or you're like doing, you know, you're grading the multiple choice individual test as they're doing their team test to kind of get an idea of which questions are being missed. Um, and then, so then you can do your clarifying lecture on that. Um, in my most recent class, uh, the students like practically begged me to code at them. Um, and, so, and so I did that much more where I would, you know, say, okay, what do you, what do you wanna see? And then I would kind of live code and, you know, make the mistakes and like, oh, why is this? And somebody would say, oh, well, you know, whatever. Like you forgot semicolon, you told. Or um, so then I would, yeah. So that so that the clarifying lecture can be coding at them, which I totally try to avoid and did so with the the data science majors. But for the non majors, um, they found it really really helpful for me to to code at them. Okay, I think that actually addressed most of the, the questions, um, if not all of them. Um, also, there was a lot, I'm sure you've seen them, lots of thank you messages. People picked up some things that were really helpful. Um, so if there's nothing else, uh, we will say good afternoon. Um, please come join us again February 15th uh, for our next webinar. And Eric, thank you very much for sharing this. Obviously, this is something that's really um, appeals to a lot of people. We're all kind of struggling with it a little bit. Um, and so it's great to hear some ideas of how to, to do this. Great. Well, it was my pleasure. And all right. Thanks, everybody.